Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting our students to learn what we teach. And I am Rob Alvarez. I'm the founder of Professor Game and professor of gamification and games-based solutions at IE Business School, EFMD, EBS University, and many other places around the world. And if this content is for you, then please go ahead and subscribe to our email list for free at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, and welcome back to the Professor Game podcast. And we have an episode today with Andrew, who is right there patiently waiting. But Andrew, before we start, before we take off, we need to know, are you prepared to engage? Let's do it. Let's do this because Andrew is the co-founder at Ro- Royama, Rolama. How, how, Rolama, how we Rolama yeah. Uh, uh, the, the Llama is our mascot. We're a Llama-themed English uh, practice app. <laughs> Which is, as Andrew very much, we're very well said, a new gaming website for English language practice. And he used to be an English and primary class teacher for 15 years in the UK, Malaysia, and China. And now he's running this startup, Rolama, full-time to make, help make, English grammar practice fun for kids. So very much on our way, on the the way we do things, the way we roll, so to speak. So Andrew, is there anything else you want to make sure you add before we start the interview? No, that's a a good summary, Rob. Uh, Thanks for having me on and uh, happy to get started. Yeah, let's go. And, And Andrew, you know, being with your startup and doing all sorts of new things, and of course, we ask this to all our guests. We want to know what it looks like to be you. We, we're especially curious with, you know, your situation where you have the startup. You're, you know, as far as I understand, you're you're getting your your gear ready to do all these things. Of course, there's stuff going out already. So we, we're curious. We want to know, what does it look like to be Andrew in a day like today or, or last week, whatever you want to go for? Yeah, my my life's very different to, uh, to what it was even a year ago. So having gone from 15 years standing in front of kids every day, teaching in the classroom, now I'm sat at home on my own on the laptop. So my days are very quiet in that sense. And uh, I, we're an early stage startup. So we, we launched to customers about eight months ago. And I'm still in that stage of a kind of early growth where I've got that kind of anxiety of, is this project going to work? Is it going to pay the bills one day? And uh, most of my time is spent either managing customer service, building extra levels and pages in our game and uh, handling emails and all that type of boring stuff. So yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a weird lifestyle compared to um, being a class teacher, that's for sure. That is definitely the case. But, and this is sort of going a bit on the sidelines. Would you recommend this kind of thing to other fellow teachers who might be thinking about doing something perhaps along the lines of, you know, jumping head on, you know, to, to become entrepreneurs or to do their this initiative or whatever that looks like? Yeah, it definitely ticks a lot of boxes for me in terms of being my own boss, having no deadlines, having no paperwork that you have to do. Like the, these are some of the things that were, grinding me down a little bit in the, in the classroom job. Would I recommend it? I think you need to have a good idea and I think you need to flesh it out pretty well before uh, taking the leap that I've done and going full time on something. I think, you know, I'd recommend building a, a side project, a, a side hustle is, is a great thing for your own kind of creativity and, and an outlet for like an idea, maybe solving a problem in your industry. That's kind of where my project got started. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's for everybody. There's certainly a lot of drawbacks to doing it by yourself. And I do miss the certainty of having a a monthly salary. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of perks too. I am sure there are many perks and lots of excitement as well in that sense, because, you know, it's it's all about doing your own thing. It's it's different from working for somebody else who is, you know, not only calling the shots, but also, you know, giving you that certainty, that security of, you know, if things go wrong, it's, yeah. It's on me. Yeah, it's that's tired. right. I think it's my when, own. Yeah, when you have a when you have a boss, I mean, uh, it you, you're at least kind of being given direction, and you know these are the tasks that you need to fulfill. When you're your own boss, it's liberating, but it's also scary in the sense that no, no one's telling you what's the next step. Especially when you're building something new, there isn't really a playbook for this is the next thing that you need to do. You can of course gather advice and and talk to people, network. You, the, there's plenty of advice out there and I, I've found a lot of really good free resources, people to chat to and uh, advice. But 
yeah, it's scary. Every day you kind of wake up and like, right, what's going to increase my chances of making this project to uh, succeed? And there's, yeah. there's any number of things that you can choose to do with your time. That is definitely the case. I can, I can attest <laughs> to that for sure. Having, as you know, engagers, I've been dedicating myself a lot more to all the business related podcasts, to the Professor Game podcast, to the consulting, to the teaching, all that. I can definitely attest to that. I definitely don't have your experience yet. <laughs> Haven't gone that far at this point, but but definitely trying to get there for sure with a completely different thing. So, Andrew, thanks for sharing all of that. And and I, I we're going to actually have to hold you a little bit to the fire in many ways because we're going to ask you about one of those difficult times, which I'm sure you have had your fair share of being an entrepreneur. And it's about one of those times where you would call this what we like to say is a favorite fail or first attempt in learning. One of those times when you're trying to do something perhaps with Ro Rolama or whatever that is, especially if it's related, of course, to entertainment, games, and education. Sure, sure, yeah. So we started building this uh, site, just just a very quick background. So I was teaching in Shanghai and uh, a lot of my children were second language English speakers. And um, we wanted to give them a fun way to practice some parts of English grammar Something as simple as using was and were. So uh, in English, the matching the, the verb and the subject is something that native speakers probably don't think very much about. But for second language speakers, choosing between was and were is difficult when, uh, in, for example, in Mandarin, there's, there's no change to the verb. It doesn't matter who is the subject or even what is the tense of the verb. Mandarin verbs don't change. So anyway, we're finding a way to help kids practice this because, you know, you need to put in the repetitions. You need to practice this thousands and thousands of times before it becomes second nature. So we started building some small games. And one of the fails that we had early on was a game that didn't penalize wrong answers. So we had a multiple choice question. So it was or were a sentence with a gap and the player just has to choose was or were. And very quickly, this is play testing with my year six class, 10 year olds. Very quickly, they worked out that there wasn't a penalty for wrong answers. So you can guess what they were doing, which was just smashing one of the buttons as fast as they could uh, <laughs> and uh, racing to see who could get the highest score, which was a lot of fun, but no learning value whatsoever. So uh, we very quickly realized that we needed to penalize wrong answers. So they would actually have to think about the answer and read the sentence. And so we solved that problem by having a negative point for a wrong answer. And then we ended up dressing up that game with a theme of, uh, we call it scoop snatcher now. So the player has to stack up scoops of ice cream on a cone. And if they get one wrong, then our mascot takes one of the scoops away. So they're trying to build up a tall stack of ice cream scoops on the cone. Really? But yeah, that was an example of how we, we quickly realized uh, when, when it was play tested that uh, ki kids will always look for um, an exploit. <laughs> Absolutely, especially when grades are involved, isn't that right? Yeah, sure. I mean, in, in this case, uh, it was also about the bragging rights. You know, it was, can I, yeah. uh, can I get a higher score than the person sat next to me? And uh, especially some kids, they love to show off with the high score. Uh, it can be a big motivator, but of course, there's, there's no point if, if they're not learning anything from it. That is certainly the case. So, Andrew, let's, let's actually flip it entirely around and go for one of those times that instead of being a fail or a first attempt at learning, you actually did something really well and something you could be proud of. One of those proud moments, we like to call it, especially, of course, if it has to do with Rolama or anything uh, related to this topic that we're discussing right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been a few milestones. We passed one uh, this week, actually. We passed a million games have been played in our database by players since we launched last year. So that was a proud moment. When we first launched, it was the small milestone of getting the, the first subscriber and then 100 subscribers. And, and now uh, we're, we're a bit past that and up to a million games played by kids. So that's a million minutes of uh, practice that kids have done on Roll Armor around the world. So that was, that was a proud moment. But in, in terms of the product and the game design, my favorite game of ours is called Space Race, which is uh, it's another multiple choice question game. But we wanted to have a risk reward structure or mechanic where the player has to really think about how sure they are of, of an answer. And the visual representation of this was um, the llama's neck growing longer. So we've got a, a llama sat there in a, in a field and 
for every correct answer, the neck grows longer exponentially. Mm. So it gets it grows longer and longer, uh, and then one wrong answer brings it back down to earth. So the the student has to like get a chain, a streak of correct answers to do well in that game. And that was about focusing them in and being sure before they answer. So basically, we're a platform. Imagine if Nintendo made a uh, grammar test and then dressed it up like uh, Mario Party or something. We're kind of like uh, <laughs> hardcore grammar exercises and activities, but with very colorful clothing. And so we've got 250 different games in uh, 15 different modes, different things, uh, error spotting, pair matching, all different different uh, game types. And then um, so the kids... Uh, the kids have a, a pet llama and they play games to win coins and buy clothes for the llama and, and medals and so forth. So yeah, that's what we've built over the past two years. So uh, it's it's uh, my wife who's the artist and also an English teacher. And right. then I'm, I've got three freelance coders who are bringing our designs to life. And then uh, I'm kind of the overall project manager, I guess, uh, and doing the, the admin and the behind the scenes stuff as well. Would you say that there's anything like, of course, we don't need you to reveal your your deepest secrets, so to speak. But is there any anything that you would say that this is one of was one of the keys to your success? One of the things that you say, well, good thing we did this because it actually improved at least our chances of success at that point. Yeah, I think having an avatar with accessories, I think, is such a key for like getting kids to buy into something like this. So th there's loads of websites for grammar practice. The difference is with ours is the kids have got some sort of ownership and there's an incentive for them to keep coming back so one of the main things is uh, is having an avatar they can look after it they can feed it they can uh, watch it grow up so we've, we've got um so my wife was a big pokemon game player growing up and so she wanted to have this mechanic where we could uh, basically <laughs> start with a, a little baby llama and then the more you play the llama starts to grow up so we've got four stages of evolution of your llama And eventually, if you play for 500 games or more, I forget the number, but it, it grows into an adult and then there's extra things that you can do and it's an adult. You can give it a hairstyle and change the color of the fur and stuff. But I think that's a key gamification mechanic to get the kids to buy in. And then if you've got kids that actually ask to play a game and all they're essentially doing is practicing a, a learning point, but they actually want to do it, I think you're a long way to winning the battle as a teacher. And that's that's crucial because that one, one of the things that I, I like to talk a lot about Duolingo as an example in my classes. Yeah. One of the things that, that is key, and, and I'm definitely not a language teacher or anything by any capacity, so you'll hopefully not correct me or correct me, please do if, if it's the case. But one of the main things in language learning, one of the most difficult things as well, is getting the people to actually practice and practice and practice all over again. I mean, it's, I would say it's not worthless, but close to it. just going to class and listening up uh, uh, different from other subjects, perhaps where, you know, you just go to class and listen and you pay a lot of attention and maybe do see the exercise in class and that's kind of enough. Languages, I feel it's exactly the opposite. You almost practice is almost more important than actually the, I would don't want to say more important than the lecture, but uh, it's it's pretty close. No, I think it is because you, it's not a knowledge problem. Like most kids could tell you that a sentence starts with a capital letter, but they it's, it's not about the knowledge of that. It's about the practice of doing that, you know, and it's only by repetition many thousands of times over many, many, many days and weeks and years that actually gets ingrained where it becomes a habit. You know, there's, there's subjects that are knowledge based and kind of you can absorb a certain level of knowledge and language from attending lectures. But I think with something like language where it's it's so instinctive, especially with second language learning, like we're focusing on you, you having to basically overcome and try and inspire a huge amount of repetition and practice for that to become a habit. And you mentioned Duolingo. I think there's a bit of a meme for for how they pester people to practice regularly. And that's kind of a, you know, the big bird <laughs> popping up and it's like, have you done your practice? I mean, essentially that's what we've tried to build for kids is a Duolingo type experience, but we've got the oversight for teachers to track what the kids are doing and celebrate their achievements and so forth. I'm not saying we've built like a Duolingo for kids, but it's not a million miles away. Amazing. Amazing. And and definitely there is a case to be made. I mean, I, I, I'm one of the fans of Duolingo, even though I, I haven't used it in quite a while. But I am one of the fans of Duolingo for many reasons. 
but it is, I mean, there's, it's hard to argue that, you know, Duolingo is, maybe they will in the future, I don't know, hopefully they won't become your competition in that sense, but it, it's not oriented towards kids learning as a second language, and especially not English, it's, it's oriented towards many languages as well and so on. But I, I wouldn't say it's oriented towards that. And, and having that, as you were mentioning, the oversight and many other things as well is, is fantastic. But it's, it's not what they are doing. So again, I, I speak highly usually of Duolingo, which I still do for sure. But it's, it's a different thing. You know, you're, you're definitely targeting something that is different and that makes your product be, you know, relevant and distinctive in that sense. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I, I've not used Duolingo myself for a long time. I'm coming purely from the, the, the classroom teacher background yeah. and I, I've kind of built something to fix a problem that was uh, I could see in my own classroom. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, hopefully we, we lighten the load. You know, we, we can, we've created something that teachers can set up very quickly. They can set it as a fun homework without any real planning. So yeah, hopefully we, I think we're fixing a, a problem that exists for, for many teachers around the world. I'm sure that is definitely the case. And I can already start thinking of many people who are trying to solve this problem in different ways and who have been trying to do different things. But I'm sure you have contact with many of them and you have done things for others as well. So, Andrew, you've been doing this for a while. I don't know how inspiration came to you, so to speak, to, to start doing this with games. If you had any, any, I don't know, if you studied something, I don't know, whatever that looks like for you. But especially we want to know if you were to set up maybe something different from Rolama, but still, you know, within that ed tech gamification, game-based learning space. Is there a series of steps that you followed when doing this or that you would follow now? Like, what would a process for doing something like this look like now for you? I think you have to start with what's the greatest learning benefit? Like, what player action is going to give you the greatest learning benefit? Like, what do you want the player to focus on when they're playing the game? I think I see a lot of games in the kind of ed tech space, which are like a game first and then a learning tool second. And it's almost yeah. like the learning is tacked on. But, you know, if a kid's going to play a game for 10 minutes, I want them thinking about the learning objective or thinking about the actual skill that I want them to do for as long of, of that 10 minutes as possible. I don't want them to play like a mini RPG for nine minutes and then answer two questions at the end. You know, it's... For a teacher, you want to kind of maximize that for the greatest learning benefit. So I think, you know, you, you start with trying to focus in on that. And then it's like, how much do you need to add to that to dress it up and actually make it fun that the kids will actually want to do it, you know? Um, sure. So you start with the learning action in mind and then you kind of build from there rather than the other way around, you know? I think there's a lot of examples of that where you can kind of see like somebody's built a fun game and then they just stuck a few multiple choice questions on top of it. <laughs> I've seen plenty of those for sure. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. So Andrew, you've been talking about your ups, you've been talking about your downs, you've been talking about how do you start with, how would you start with a new project and, and probably a, a significant part of what you did with Rolama as well. And again, with your experience with what you've done to this date, would you say that there is some some sort of best practice, something that you would say, well, if you include this or if you do this kind of thing within your work in gamification, game-based learning, it would at least help make your project a little bit better. Okay. So one thing I really like, I don't know, have you played Zelda Breath of the Wild? I really want to, but I okay, haven't. Okay, so the one one really cool thing about Breath of the Wild is you can run up to the final boss within about 15 minutes of starting the game if you want. You'll get absolutely obliterated because the boss is too hard, but <laughs> you can do it if you want to. And I I thought that was quite a unique game design because normally the boss is hidden at the very end of the game and you have to do so many steps to unlock the door kind of thing. But on Zelda, you can... Uh, as soon as you've got out of the cave, you can pretty much run straight to the final castle and get your shield handed back to you. But what I took from that is like, it's good to unlock everything. Like let the player choose their own difficulty level, let them choose what they want to practice and don't make people like grind and like robotically repeat to things that they know how to do just to get to a fun part or just get just to get to the piece that they want to play. 
so uh, I think with that, uh, it means like the, you've given the player like full choice of how they spend their time on the game. You know, I wouldn't want to waste a player's time, you know, beating the easy levels in order to get to the hard levels. Oh. It's like, if you want to go to the hard level, go for it. You know, you can choose that. It might not be right for you and you might fail and <laughs> realize, oh yeah, I need to dial it down. I need to play an easier level. But by doing it that way, it means that we're not, prescribing to the player oh this is the level of difficulty that you need to do it's like give them the choice that makes a lot of sense and i can think of like 20 examples where that is definitely getting applied in games gamification game-based learning projects that i've seen for sure so thank you for that great recommendation andrew and talking about recommendations you mentioned that you've heard a few episodes as well you've now heard the questions and answered many of them yourself is there somebody that comes to mind that you say, well, I would like to hear this person on the podcast as well, listening, uh, answering actually these questions? Well, I don't know if you could get him, but uh, Shigeru Miyamoto is quite an interesting guest. <laughs> I don't know if you know him. <laughs> for uh, sure. And, and funny enough, you're not the first one to ask for <laughs> Shigeru Miyamoto. Yeah, you, you might not be able to get him though, unfortunately. I will tell you my inspiration for making Roll Armor is a guy who's made a really cool maths times table practice website in the UK. This guy is called Bruno Reddy. He's made a product called Times Table Rockstars, which um, primary school teachers in the UK for sure will, will definitely know. And uh, he's a really generous guy. He gave me a lot of advice early on when I essentially came to him and said, like, I want to build a gamification for English grammar and he gave me a lot of advice and pointers um, on how to do it so yeah I think um, Br Bruno would be a very cool guest because he, he's really uh, a, a big figure in the UK like ed tech scene sounds like an amazing one and, and interesting enough as well that I haven't heard of <laughs> I've probably mentioned this already several times on the podcast but it was uh, one of the, the funny moments I had you know now it's been five years so probably six years ago was my mom saying like, oh yeah, but you, do you really think you'll be able to keep this up? You know? <laughs> keep on getting new people who are doing something like, like it's very niche and I'm not saying it's not niche, but do you really think you can get one one podcast guest every week? <laughs> and well, here we are, yeah. 280 something or 90 something at this point, probably episodes after that. Awesome. Still having you love the dedication. <laughs> So thank you for that recommendation for sure, Andrew. And, and keeping up that recommendation space, is there a book that you would recommend the engagers? And of course, let us know why. I'm going to have to cheat here. So I've not really read any books about gamification. So I was wrecking my brains. I'm going to recommend a YouTube channel, if I may. You may have had this recommended <laughs> before. There's a guy called Mark Brown that makes the Game Makers Toolkit on YouTube absolutely stunning video essays about game design, a lot of detail. H have you seen him before? I'm not sure. Maybe I, I'll, I'll look into it in a okay. second and see. It's like a video exactly. game analysis and breakdown of like the whole design process. Really, really interesting. Goes into lots of detail about choices of video game designers, about difficulty and pacing and everything. Loads of things. And the other one is another interesting podcast called Designer Notes, which is like interviews with video game designers as well. So yeah, sorry, I had to cheat on the books. I've not got any gamification books. I'm, I'm interested to hear your recommendations, actually, because uh, I've not read a gamification book. Well, there's, there's plenty going around, and, and I've also had the occasional guest recommending something like Lord of the Rings by Tolkien because of the epic adventures and the detailed storytelling I, and the okay, world creation. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so on and so forth, for yeah. sure. I'm, I'm, I'm using that one because it's a book <laughs> or a bunch of books that I definitely like. Yeah, a yeah. lot. Sure, <laughs> so, sure. So, so, so there's that. And Andrew, you know, we've we've talked about other people, but we would like to know as well. What would you say is your superpower? That thing that you do at least better than most most others in this ad tech and gamification world. I think I've got to focus on like my experience as classroom teacher. So, I was, 15 years I was working with uh, children aged like 10 to 15, and that yeah, 15 years gives you a good understanding of how kids think um what works in the classroom and uh that's yeah. kind of fueled my design process it, i was lucky enough to be able to te like play test it with my class last year and then uh my wife is working at school now so she can have like direct uh, feedback from using it in her classroom as well but i think but it you know it, it's knowing your customer i think is the kind of general point is like 
that's a superpower when it comes to building a game. And it, you know, that might come down to as building something that you like for yourself. You know, it's like make a game that you would want to play. And for sure, I would want to play Roll Armor when I was a kid. And for sure, I wanted it when I was a classroom teacher to be able to to use in my students. So it, I think it's about you know focus on your audience and build something that you would want to use yourself. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And let's actually go for a very difficult question, some would argue. And it has to do with what is your favorite game? And of course, being the creator of Rollama, we have to ask you, you already mentioned that you would definitely play it. I'm sure you would as a kid. But besides Rollama or right next to Rollama, what would be your favorite game? I'm going to say Portal, the first person she, uh, from Valve's. I mean, I'm a 90s kid, grew up playing games from the very start, like the NES, right through to uh, got a Nintendo Switch now still. So I've been playing games, you know, over 30 years. So it's hard to pick one, but uh, Portal is just, just awesome game design in terms of the mechanic, first of all, the Portal gun, uh, I just think it's absolute genius. But it's also a really, really cleverly made game in terms of the tutorial is showing the player how the mechanic works and what you can do with it in a very cool way that Valve has mastered in terms of showing the player but not telling them exactly. It's just a masterpiece. I've got a list as long as you like. I mean, multiplayer games, I, I play a lot with my wife. Uh, there's a cool <laughs> co-op game called Overcooked that we play a lot where you're both cooking in the kitchen and you're, you kind of got these characters getting in each other's way, trying to make the food and get it out on time. And uh, yeah, I could go on and on. I've got, I've got dozens of games that I love. <laughs> but your favorite one, if we had to call it, it would be Portal. Portal, yeah. Portal's amazing. Amazing, amazing. So thank you very much for that, Andrew. And, you know, before, of course, letting you go and go on to your next thing, continue to work on making Rolama amazing and, and arrive to everybody that needs Rolama in their lives. We need to know if you have any, any final words, any final piece of advice. And of course, let us know where we can find out more about you about Rollama and all the work you guys are doing, good work you're doing out there in the world. Yeah, I'm going to be cheesy here and um, give a quote, which is George Bernard Shaw. He says, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So that's my philosophy. No, no. Keep, keep playing. G games are not for children. Games are for everyone. And never be ashamed to add gamification to your toolkit. So yeah, I, I'm... Uh, I'm at rollarmor.com. You can find all the links to all of our socials there. And we've got plenty of free sample games uh, if you want to have a play around. rollarmor.com. Amazing. Thank you very much again for all of that, for sharing all that time, your experience, your knowledge, your understanding, your ups, your downs here on Professor Game. However, as you know now, and of course the engagers definitely know, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, and thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed this interview with Andrew. Well, it is time for asking the question about if you have any questions to ask future guests. I'm sure you do. If so, please go to professorgame.com slash question and ask that question. Once it is selected, it'll come up in a future episode when we have time, when the interview is not going super long, and you will get that answer live with such guest and remember before you go on to your next mission please remember to subscribe or follow whatever that button looks like using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of professor game see you there